In December 1872, when I was 18 years old, I enlisted in the 24th Regiment and received the princely pay of six pence a day, of which 3.5 pence was deducted for messing and washing, leaving one shelling, 5.5 pence a week, for luxuries. I went to bed every night hungry but quite happy, and it made a man of me. The regiment had just come home from India after 15 years. Now, the A Company of any regiment in those days was always called the Grenadier Company and was supposed to have the biggest men. I think the sergeant major must have been a wee bit humorous, for he posted me to our A Company, although I stood only 5 foot 6 inches and was painfully thin. After five years of home service, in February 1878, the regiment received sudden orders to proceed to the Cape of Good Hope to take part in the Kafir War. This was my first experience of active service, and shortly after, my colonel promoted me, Colour Sergeant of B Company, a hundred strong. I was only twenty-three, very nervous, sensitive, and afraid of my new responsibilities. Several men of the company were my own age, others older, and some old enough to be my father. But after a few months, I felt secure and thought I was getting along quite well. I also found myself unpaid private secretary to several men who could barely read or write, and I deciphered and answered their letters home, feeling quite happy in our relations. One day, I heard a man named Wall ask my Batman if the kid was in. A day or two later, I asked Partridge casually who the kid was, and received the answer, Why you are, of course. My stock slumped at once. I think it does us all good to have our swollen heads reduced. But we were a very happy family. You can't live in tents and on Mother Earth for two years on active service without knowing your men intimately. The Kaffir War ended in June 1878, and we were moved to Peter Maritzburg, Natal, to assist in raising the curtain on the Zulu drama. On January 11, 1879, we crossed the Buffalo River at Rourke's Drift into Zulu country. Our commander-in-chief was Lord Chelmsford. Our strength was 4,500 men, including 13 companies of my regiment, the 24th, now the South Wales borderers. One company was left behind at Rourke's Drift to guard the hospital stores and the pontoons at the drift on the Buffalo River. This was my company, and at the time I was bitterly disappointed. We saw the main column under Lord Chelmsford engage the enemy at once, and I watched the action, along with my four sergeants, from a little hill by Rourke's Drift. Then we saw them move on again and they disappeared. And now I must tell you what happened to them during the next ten days. They made their camp under a hill called Isandalwana, about ten miles away. Then, days later, on the 21st, Lord Chelmsford learned that the enemy was in force ahead of the camp, and he moved out on the morning of the 22nd with nearly half his force to attack them. But as he advanced, they disappeared, and in his absence his camp was attacked and overwhelmed by 4,000 Zulus. So swift was the disaster that the few survivors who got away could give no reliable account of it, but the evidence of the dead, who were afterwards found and buried where they lay, told the unvarying tale of groups of men fighting back to back until the last cartridge was fired. After the war, Zulu witnesses all told the same story. At first we could make no headway against the soldiers, but suddenly they ceased to fire. Then we came round them and killed them with our assegais. According to one account, the last survivor was a drummer boy who flung his short sword at a Zulu. This was the last occasion that band or drummer boys were taken on active service, as it was also the last occasion that the colours were carried into action. Lieutenants Melville and Coghill lost their lives that day trying to save the colours. Fully 1,200 men were killed, and by half past one, no white man was alive in Izandalwana camp. Of course, back at Rourke's Drift, 
we knew nothing of this disaster, although my sergeants and I on our hill above it could hear the guns and see the puffs of smoke. But an hour later, at two o'clock, a few refugees arrived and warned us of what to expect. One man whispered to me, not a fighting chance for you, young fella. Up to that time, we had done nothing to put our small post in a defensive position, as our force in front was nearly 5,000 strong and had six guns, and the last thing we expected was that we should be the saviours of the remainder of that force. The strength of our small garrison at the drift was two combatant and six departmental officers and 133 non-commissioned officers and men, 36 of whom were sick, leaving about 100 fighting men. Remember that 1,200 men had just been massacred at Isandalwana. Can you then be surprised that, flushed with their success, the Zulus were making for our small post, confident that we should be easy victims to their savagery? Having had the warning, but only two hours in advance as it turned out, we set to work to loophole the two buildings and to connect the front of the hospital with a stone cattle kraal by sacks of Indian corn and oats, and to draw up two Boer transport wagons to join the front of the commissariat stores with the back of the hospital. These proved excellent barricades, but by no means impregnable. The native has always been credited with deep cunning, but luckily for us, if the Zulu possessed any, he did not use it. For as the sacks connecting the hospital had to be laid on a slope of the ground, he could safely have crept along, cut the sacks open with his assegais, the corn would have rolled out, and he could have walked in, and I should not now be telling the story. When Lieutenant Chard of the Royal Engineers joined us, he approved of what we had done, but considered that our inner space was too big, and suggested a line of biscuit boxes. This was done and proved of great value when the enemy set the hospital on fire. I was instructed to post a man as lookouts in the hospital at the most vulnerable points and to take out and command a line of skirmishers. Shortly after 3.30, an officer commanding a troop of natal light horse arrived, having got away from his Isandalwana, and asked Lieutenant Chard for instructions. He was ordered to send detachments to observe the drift and pontoons, and to place outposts in the direction of the enemy to check his advance. About 4.15, the sound of firing was heard behind the hill on our front. The officer returned and reported the enemy close upon us. He also reported that his 100 men would not obey his orders and had ridden off. About the same time, another detachment of 100 men belonging to the natal native contingent bolted, including their officer himself. I am glad to say he was brought back some days later, court-martialed and dismissed from the service. The desertion of these detachments of 200 men appeared at first sight to be a great loss, with only a hundred of us left. But the feeling was that we could not have trusted them, and also that our defences were too small to accommodate them anyhow. We knew now that whatever might happen, we had to fight it out alone. And about 4.30 the enemy, from 500 to 600 strong, came in sight round the hill to our south, and driving my thin red line of skirmishers, made a rush at our south wall. They were met and held by a steady and deliberate fire for a short time. Then, being reinforced by some hundreds, they made desperate and repeated attempts to break through our temporary defences but were repulsed time and again. To show their fearlessness and their contempt for the red coats and small numbers, they tried to leap the parapet and at times seized our bayonets, only to be shot down. Looking back, one cannot but admire their fanatical bravery. About seven o'clock, they succeeded, after many attempts, in setting fire to the hospital. The small number we were able to spare defended it room by room, bringing out all the sick who could be moved before they retired. Privates Hook, R. Jones, W. Jones and J. Williams were the last to leave, holding the door with the bayonet when all their ammunition was expended. The Victoria Cross was awarded to these men, and they fully deserved it. The Zulus had collected the rifles from the men who they had killed at Isandalwana 
and had captured the ammunition from the mules which had stampeded and threw their loads, so our own arms were used against us. In fact, this was the cause of every one of our casualties, killed and wounded, and we should have suffered many more if the enemy had known how to use a rifle. There was hardly a man even wounded by an assegai's, their principal weapon. The attack lasted from 4.30 p.m. on the 22nd to 4.00 a.m. on the 23rd, 12 exciting hours, and when daybreak occurred, the enemy was out of sight. About seven o'clock, they appeared again to the southwest. But help was at hand. Lord Chelmsford, with the other half of his original force, was only an hour's march away. On the previous afternoon, he had learned of the destruction of his camp at Isandlwana. A certain Commandant Lonsdale had chanced to ride back to the camp and had been fired at by Zulus, wearing our men's uniform. He escaped by a miracle and was able to report the news to Lord Chelmsford. They got back to camp that night, but they found a grim and silent scene as they cautiously approached. The next day they resumed their march and appeared at Rourke's Drift, and our enemy retired. In his dispatch afterwards, Lord Chelmsford said, To our intense relief, the waving of hats was seen from the hastily erected entrenchments, and information soon reached me that the garrison had for twelve hours made the most gallant resistance I have ever heard of against the determined attack of some three thousand Zulus, three hundred and fifty of whose dead bodies surrounded the post. Our losses were seventeen killed and nine wounded. Theirs, 351 killed that we buried. Their wounded must have been 400 to 500, which they removed under the cover of night. There are two things which I think have made Rourke's Drift stand out so vividly after all these years. The first, that it took place on the same day as the terrible massacre at Isandlwana, and the second, that Natal was saved from being overrun by a savage and victorious foe. Seven VCs were awarded to this one company of the regiment, which is now the South Wales Borderers. I have told you the names of the four men who won the VC. The other three were Left 10 and Bromhead, Corporal Allen and Private F. Hitch. The Victoria Cross was also awarded to Left 10 and Chard, Royal Engineers, Surgeon Reynolds and Corporal Sheese, but not one, I regret to say of those VCs is alive today. In fact, there are only six survivors of Rourke's Drift alive today. Ex-Privates W. Cooper, G. Edwards, H. Martin, W. Owens, H. Williams, and myself. Left ten ants charred and Bromhead, and the men received the thanks of Parliament, the officers being promoted to the rank of Major. I was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal with an annuity of $10 the same awarded to the Victoria Cross, and awarded a commission. But as I was the youngest of eight sons, and the family exchequer was empty, I had to refuse it that time. Now, just one word for the men who fought that night. I was moving amongst them all the time, and not for one moment did they flinch. Their courage and their bravery cannot be expressed in words. For me, they were an example of my soldiering days. The following year, Queen Victoria received at Windsor Castle a colour party of the regiment and decorated the Queen's colour with a silver wreath of immortelles in memory of Lieutenants Melville and Coggill for their devotion in trying to save the colours on the 22nd of January, that was at Isandalwana, and for the noble defence of Rourke's Drift. So, if you ever have the great privilege of seeing the colours of the South Wales borderers uncased, you will see the wreath. The original wreath, presented by Her Majesty, is now in the regimental chapel of Brecon Cathedral. You may have seen the famous picture of Rourke's Drift, painted by that great French artist de Neuville, and the original is in the officer's mess of the 2nd Battalion, now at Londonderry.